There's a lot of firsts you can discuss with Warhammer. The first miniature you painted, or the first book you read, or something with Games Workshop itself, like the first plastic miniature, the first Horus Heresy novel, or something perhaps slightly more critical of them, like the first time they did something like raise the price of paint while reducing how much you get in a single pot. I'm excited for the day we get to the point you get enough for one single brushstroke at the low, low cost of 50 US dollars. But I will end my complaining about Games Workshop until the end of this video because I'm discussing a Warhammer fantasy character and you all know how that ends. As for which Warhammer fantasy character, well, I'm assuming you can read and already know. But to tie back into the rant I started with, today is all about arguably the very first Warhammer Fantasy special character, the Lich Master Heinrich Kemmler. If you're one of those fine people who remembers when Warhammer miniatures look like this, then clamp those nostalgia goggles on tight because we're going old school with this one. And speaking of firsts, much like the topic of today's video is the first special character in Warhammer history, today's sponsor is the first VPN I ever heard about, and indeed, the first and only I use myself. Tell me, do you know what a man in the middle attack is? It's when you're out and about, living your life, when you suddenly see that whatever place you're at has a free Wi-Fi connection. You go, hey sweet, free Wi-Fi, and connect to it. Well yes, you do have free Wi-Fi, it turns out that the Wi-Fi isn't actually the stores. It's some goober hosting it to get the information of whoever joins, which now includes you. So if you connect to something important, like your banking app, you just gave the imposter all the information he needs. Luckily, if you use NordVPN, your data will be encrypted even in this worst case scenario. And you know what else NordVPN is great for? Keeping malware out of your device. NordVPN's threat protection features are the finest available on the market. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I am not as observant as I could be when I'm looking online for material for my videos. I see something and go, hey, that looks neat, and I don't really look at where it takes me. Thankfully though, I use NordVPN, which has built-in features to not only scan downloads for malware, but automatically block harmful URLs. And honestly, I can't tell you enough just how nice it is knowing there's something keeping me safe, regardless of the fact I'm probably diving headfirst into Virus Town as often as not. And do you know how all these safety features and more are activated? Surely it's some complicated process of putting X file into Y folder before enabling Z program, right? Nah, not at all. Just click the quick connect button and you're safe just like that. And if all that isn't enough for you, how about this? Using my link in the description as well as the pinned comment of this video, you get not only a huge discount on whichever plan you choose, but four months free on top of that. That link is on screen right now for your convenience, and just so no one's left out, let me spell it out for you. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash nordvpn.com slash pancreas no work. And if for some reason you decide that Nord isn't for you, it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. Internet safety is paramount in this day and age, and with my link you get to try it out risk-free. So what are you waiting for? Get NordVPN today and ensure you're safer than ever online. All right, Kemmler time. Anyone know where Krill is? Heinrich Kemmler is, like I said, one of, if not the first Warhammer Fantasy special character. And since fantasy predates 40k, that means he's older than the entire setting of 40k. His competition is this guy, Harry, some chaos warrior who hates undead. Though from my research, Kemmler was an actual character first and not artwork that later became a character. Either way, the point is Kemmler's old as fuck and I'm only mentioning Harry because if I don't, there's gonna be 500 comments going, um, actually, and bringing him up. Now that I've gotten my straw man of the video out of the way, onto the lore. So old is Kemmler, in fact, that when he was introduced, Warhammer was equal parts tabletop wargame and RPG. There were rules for expanding on your army as the game of Warhammer went on, and truth be told from what I could find on the game, it barely resembled Modern Warhammer at all. He's had his old lore almost entirely rewritten at one point, so let's cover both iterations of the character. His old lore won't take too long, since ironically for the game being part RPG at this point, the setting of Warhammer Fantasy wasn't terribly developed at this period. This was the time when things like Half-Orcs and Zotes were a part of the setting, by which I of course mean they were noticeable in the lore, not they were in one paragraph in the Flingo the Witch Hunter novel as a myth in some Imperial Wizard's library kind of lore. At first he was just your run-of-the-mill evil necromancer, as one is. He rose to power and was then violently ejected from power in the Terror of the Lichmaster campaign for early Warhammer Fantasy. He fled and wandered to some monastery pretending to be a pilgrim, but unfortunately for our boy Kemi, the abbot in charge managed to see through his disguise and separated him from his source of power. Which at the time was left unclear what it was, but now we would know as the magical wind of Shyesh, death. How the hell this random abbot managed to do this is unclear, because that's some crazy power right there. Would have been real helpful to have at any point in Warhammer history, honestly. Could have just thrown that guy in Malekith and there's half the problems of the world solved. After this, he wanders around for a while and the abbot thinks that his problems are over, but uh oh, Kemmler found a demon of Nurgle who was for some reason interested in necromancy. Necromancy supposedly is anathema to chaos, but early on this wasn't so. The demon said in exchange for allegiance to chaos he'd restore Kemmler's power, and even give him a little bit of each person who solely gave to the demon. And I gotta say, that's probably the single most straightforward and non-manipulative a demon has ever been in these settings. Just straight up, serve me, you get your magic back, and a little bit off the top of everyone you get for me. Naturally, Kemmler took the deal 
on account of being just a little bit desperate as well as a lot of bit insane by this point, and it was time for round two. This is the premise of the campaign, The Vengeance of the Lich Master. Funnily enough, this was also the introduction of the Skaven as a race, as one of the ways the players could deal with Kemler was either by using a Warpstone artifact to counter him, which would have been about as safe to handle as you'd expect, or of making some bargains with the Skaven to get their help. He started attacking isolated places such as Hamlets, Dwarf Outpost, and the like, during which time the players have a chance of limiting what damage he can do. Eventually, he's secure enough to raise an ancient champion, Hans Wemmer. Apparently, Krell changed his name in the four decades or so since now and then. This happens, and he decides to launch an all-out attack on the Abbey where he lost his powers. Then the players put him in the ground for good this time. At least, that's the lore of the story. Theoretically, the players could fail to defeat him in either of these campaigns, and the happy ending just doesn't happen. And thus ends the tale of Heinrich Kemmler the Lich Master. Until it was time for some retcons... In more modern canon, Kemmler was the sort of guy who was always a bit power-hungry, and since necromancy is a valid profession in this universe, he figured that was a great way to escape the issue of mortality and gain a bit of strength. Much like Cetra, Kemmler realized he was gonna die eventually, although he handled it perhaps less gracefully than Cetra and his mortuary cult. By the time he was around 40, he could just walk into a graveyard and a couple minutes later walk out with a few hundred of his new closest undead friends. He would just ransack anywhere he went looking for knowledge. Powerful wizard hidden from society, you're getting your fancy tower absolutely looted. Ancient temple that stood strong for a thousand years? Apologies, but it won't be making it to a thousand and one years after Kemmler's done with it. There once was a council of nine necromancers very creatively known as the Council of Nine, which is some of that GW creativity coming at you hot and fresh out of the oven. Anyways, yeah, he beat them. They were Bretonian, so this was a service to the world undoubtedly. They could have been nine Mother Teresas and I would have supported the murder of Bretonians. There was also, of course, the time he killed three vampire wizards in the Empire, known as the Vampire Wizards of Bloodwald. The naming scheme continues, as does Kemmler's win streak. He also fought a lich and absolutely bodied that bastard, straight up gave him the old one-two buckle his shoe. Indeed, this is how he gets the name the Lich Master in modern canon. And for decades, this just kept going on. Kemmler and a few thousand zombies show up, take whatever Kemmler needs, clown on the guy in charge, and then leave. Unfortunately for Kemmler, he apparently forgot the setting he was in and how no one in it is gonna turn the other cheek. Enough of the people he fucked with were apparently left alive that he ended up getting quite the alliance formed against him. And at the Battle of 10,000 Skulls, a name that manages to be both metal as hell, unbelievably informative, and unbelievably uninformative all at once, his many enemies finally brought him low. He managed to drive them off, but Kemmler was left broken in mind and body both. Then he found a great tomb of an even greater Chaos Champion, Krell, now properly named. He struck a pact with Dark God, same as before, just a bit fancier this time around, and got himself a little manservant for his troubles. Well, little, twice as tall as him, same difference really. And then they just started going ape shit all around the world. World. They attacked an abbey again, because why not at this point, though unfortunately some Bretonian asshole or other managed to drive them and the Skaven that were also attacking off. Probably through the power of giving the Lady of the Lake enough of his hard-earned simp bucks until she gave him a power-up or something, I don't know. K and K also like to screw with the Whittles every now and then. Apparently, the Azrai live on top of at least a couple of ancient human burial grounds that are focal points of magic. Unfortunately for the Wood Elves, who relied on these magical cairns to help keep their trees in tip-top shape, Kemmler wanted to ransack them for their magical energies like a Captain Planet villain. And he did. He was smart enough to realize the people who lived in trees would be weaker during winter, and the plan went through without a hitch despite the Wood Elves' interference. He started going ham and Athel Lauren and managed to get farther towards the Oak of Ages than any threat prior, which is pretty damn impressive considering the forest can warp time so you age to dust in moments. Durthu managed to wake up enough trees to drive Kemmler and Krell off, and some dude named Skialon sacrificed himself as well, but it was still massively damaging for the Wood Elves. Apparently, he had been coming and going for many years before this invasion, and if he was spotted, he'd either age the Wood Elves themselves to dust to be funny, or just sit Krell on him. Not many things survived close contact with Krell Platinum, so this was as good a solution to staying hidden as any. If they ever managed to corner him, he'd just turn into smoke and vanish. Kind of a dick move, but Warhammer's Wood Elves certainly deserve something like that happening to him every now and then. His actions during all this time were secretly guided by Nagash, unbeknownst to him and Krell. As someone who was undead, Krell naturally fell under Nagash's rule, or at least that's how he viewed it. Plus, Krell was at one point one of Nagash's lieutenants. Sure, Sigmar might have caved Nagash's skull in and then dealt with all those armies, but death isn't really something that stops anyone that's already come back from it once. And with Kemmler reviving Krell, this was his third life by this point, so Nagash was always trying to manipulate things so that Krell would end up under his control once again, and funnily enough, he wasn't terribly interested in Kemmler. And of course, they came to blows with Gotchik and Felix at one point. Spoilers ahead for two of the Gotchik and Felix books 
jokes, by the way. Once upon a time, there was a beastman shaman who was trying to cast a spell. This in itself wouldn't be too noteworthy, I mean, they're wizards after all, but this shaman, you see, had found a really big magical rock, and his ambition matched the size of his fuck-off rock as he wanted to cast a spell that would turn the entire empire of man into beastmen just like him. Naturally, Gotrick and Felix were going to put a stop to this alongside a small army of Imperials and a character from their very first book, but they also had the help of some crazy old guy who knew the land. He would help guide them through the barrows underneath where the beastman was performing his ritual, and in exchange, Gotrick and Felix would kill the bastard. When pressed on why he knew the routes under those barrows, he said he was a grave robber. They weren't exactly pleased to have his help, but they didn't have many choices by this point. Naturally, the beast shaman is slain. I mean, it's Gotrick and Felix. Anything fighting them is in for an ignoble defeat within a few minutes. But as I'm sure literally everyone watching this could have guessed, this crazy old man with a suspicious amount of knowledge about Cairns filled with the dead wasn't just some one-off book character. It was Kemler, and Krell wasn't far behind either. Gotrick, Felix, and their allies go from celebrating that the beastman was slain to panicking as the undead rise all around him. Alright, yeah, Gotrick wasn't panicking. That, that just didn't happen. Everyone else was, though. Gotrick absolutely flipped shit over Krell showing up, because it turns out Krell was in the Book of Grudges quite a bit. And him technically being alive means his grudge couldn't actually be crossed off, and they begin dueling. Krell's axe apparently puts glass shards into the veins whoever it strikes, though, and Gotrick looks to be on the verge of defeat even regardless of this. To avoid too many spoilers, I'll say that of course this doesn't happen, but it's interesting because while Kemler and Krell are driven off, most of the Imperial forces fighting alongside Gotrick and Felix perish to the massive army of undead Kemler has circling around him at any given moment. Plus, Gotrick was nearly put in the ground, and Felix was left pretty badly wounded himself, as was that character that returned from their early adventures, but I'd rather not spoil more about her than necessary. Snorri was also there, but I don't want to think about Snorri because I don't want to be sad right now. After this, we get to the inevitable bit of Warhammer fantasy characters that aren't one-off characters in some random book where I need to discuss the End Times lore they're a part of. The good news is that with Kemler, there's actually not much End Times lore to discuss, so our exposure to the subject will be limited. The bad news is that this is because Kemler has done so hard horrendously dirty, especially given his status as the first Warhammer special character in existence. Krell makes it out better, but Kemler is shit on. Once again, GW changed up Kemler and Krell. No, they didn't rename Krell after the composer of Modern Warfare 2 again, but they did make it so that Krell is more or less the one in charge of Kemler now, rather than the other way around. Which only makes sense, of course. Clearly the one who needs a constant source of magic due to being a necromantic being is the one in charge of the operation, not the guy actually giving him the magic he needs to stay around. Whatever, this is hardly the worst revelation the End Times gave us. Malekith, you Kentucky fried fuck. Kemler gets enlisted by Arkin the Black to go find Agash's staff, Alaka Nash. Unrelated, but isn't that just a fun name for a wizard staff, Alaka Nash? It's so fun to say. It sounds like one of those Harry Potter spells that's on the official wizardry blacklist. Probably just something like uncircumcised men or whatever. Anyways, what was I talking about? Ah yes, Kemler being asked to retrieve Nagash's big staff that pulsates with magical power dick joke. Despite Krell being reworked into basically being his boss, Kemler is still pretty independent. So while he and Arkin raised their undead armies to duke it out against some Bretonians, Arkin apparently called Kemler a servant one too many times and he decides to go rogue and take Nagash's staff for himself. He does so and just as Arkin arrives after having finished off the dirty no good Bretonian scumbags, Kemler declares his allegiance to the Chaos Gods and asks if Arkin will join him. I guess that servitude is okay when you're doing it out of your own volition or something like that. Arkin's read the Horus Heresy novels however and knows that the Chaos gods are only out for themselves and will ultimately dick you over on a whim, so he calls Kemler a dumbass and the fight begins. It's Lichmaster versus Lich in the opening fight to the end of the world. Arkin actually comments on this by the way, smart as that he is in the end times. And as for Kemler, despite being boosted in power by the Chaos gods, Arkin's thousands of years of experience carry the day and Kemler is exploded after he fails a magical beam clash. Sort of like Vegeta in the Saiyan Saga, except Kemler didn't turn into a monkey at the end, just a fine red mist. You should know that this makes Kemler the first named character killed off in the end times. It's poetic in a way. Games Workshop killed off their first special character as a way to kick off the event that killed the first Warhammer setting. It'd be cool if it weren't enraging. Although in retrospect that might have been some brave soul at Games Workshop trying to let everyone know it was coming. As for Krell, there's only so much to tell, but for the sake of bookkeeping, I'll finish his tale here. His position in life was largely that of Kemler's attack gorilla, so now that he's independent, he becomes Nagash's Mortark of Despair. He never doubts Nagash's plans or leadership, which is funny because literally everyone else involved with him does so at some point. 
going, even Arkin. What makes that really stand out is that in life, he was a Cornate Chaos Lord, but this time around he seems to be all in with Nagash. He tried to stop Nurgle demons from interrupting one of Nagash's plans, but he got vored by a great unclean one while the Skaven nuked Nagash's pyramid. Nagash brought him back to life, and then they went to Athel Loren to ally with the living. And then as the world's ending, he gets in a duel with Sigvald, Prince of Slanesh, and all around worst human being in any Warhammer setting. Krell cuts his eye out, and then Sigvald beats him to a fine powder before Throg kills Sigvald and pisses on his corpse. And the world exploded. In Age of Sigmar, there's almost nothing to tell of either of them now. There's been little bits of lore hinting that Krell is kind of still around, or at least the memory of him is, but for now neither he nor Kemmler have made any moves. They used to have their miniatures available as generic hero units, but as of now, both seem to have been taken off the store page and are thus no longer available for matched play. Kind of annoying, because I really like Kemmler and Krell, and if I knew they were gonna do that, I would've grabbed those models. So if you want these lads, you're gonna have to either find some secondhand models, recasts, or get really into playing as Kemmler in total Warhammer. If you do that third option, you at least get to spend your entire early to mid game bowling the Bretonians, which is nothing but a positive in my opinion, and fitting to his lore. One last thing before we end is that Kemmler used to have his own school of magic on the tabletop. He was at one point said to be approaching Nagash in power, and naturally his school of magic was essentially just necromancy but everything is buffed. He also had his own army list, with unique units and magical artifacts and all. Yeah, if you're like me and the idea of Games Workshop doing something cool is almost anathema to you because of how recently you got into the hobby, go read up on your Kemmler lore. But for now, we end the tale of Warhammer's first special character. Compared to a lot of others, he really didn't do too much, but honestly, I like Kemmler a lot. His existence isn't really tied into any greater powers, and he just kind of appears as a threat, which is endearing to me. Yes, he's a necromancer, so he owes his power to Nagash, ultimately, and yes, he's sworn allegiance to the Chaos Gods like five times in his lore, but it never comes across as his main characterization. These things seem like means to an end of achieving great power, not that Kemmler is all about chaos and nothing but chaos like a lot of Warhammer lore. He's just his own guy doing his own thing, not causing the most damage but enriching the setting of Warhammer fantasy nonetheless. And with that sappy little ending monologue, I would just like to say, please give the Vampire Count some new DLC Creative Assembly, it's been fucking forever, they need it. The Nagash mod for Total Warhammer 2 hasn't been ported yet, I'm dying over here, see ya, come on! Thank you of course to my wonderful channel members, you were the Krell to my Kemmler, supporting me in my endeavors for years to come. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Seriously though, CA, 100th Legendary Lord, it better be Nagash or Thanquil. Ideally Nagash, but I think he should be the most busted character in the game like he is in the mod for Warhammer 2, so if that takes some time to properly make, then it's understandable. As for Thanquil, I mean, funny rat guy, why wouldn't anyone want him in? You can even make him appear alongside Malachi McKyson and make the dwarf Hindenburg official. Or Max Schreiber and give the Empire a kick-ass wizard for their legendary lord. He could canonically wield multiple winds of magic at once, so imagine how busted that would be on the campaign.